different stages in terms of their um, skills in pottery. Um, with Latia, who's in the, on the left, top left, and Combretson on the top, on the bottom right, who are the most experienced uh, potters, and then others at different kinds of stages, and two very young people with Janet and Nicodemus, who I worked with. Um, and so what we did, we, I did a series of workshops where we um, looked at building different kinds of forms and we explored different kinds of designs and patterns and motifs based on traditional knowledge so the idea was you know as well as doing economic development is kind of reviving the knowledge that uh, was there before and the knowledge that they already have but strengthening that knowledge through craft making in this particular case case through pottery um, so yeah we did um lots of different activities um building for example just doing lots of samples of tiles with different patterns um, we made some kind of more traditional pots and i'll talk a little bit about the tumor pots in a minute i think that i think you might have seen like the pepper pot in uh, marissa's video and song but the pepper pot and tumor pot also very traditional dishes that were um, traditionally cooked in clay pots um, so yeah i'll come back to that in a second um, so the kinds of things that we did, as well as um, exploring designs and uh, forms, was that we also went out into the landscape and we looked for materials. So we, we dug clay from different sources that they knew about to kind of test them out, to see what kind of clays they were, what kind of uh, properties they had. And we tried to kind of mix different clays together. We also collected sands and different kinds of stones that we could incorporate uh, different colors, for example, into the clay. And then we made like different, uh, what we call slips, which is like colors out of the, out of the clay from uh, some of the materials that did as well. Um, so here's just a few different examples of kinds of pieces that we were, were working on. Um, so you can see that we were like looking at um, representing different kinds of uh, activities, knowledge, livelihoods, for example, on the pieces. Um, so the plate, for example, in the middle uh, is about the history of the potters and where they come from and how this tree is very important in terms of the origin of the village in which they uh, currently reside. Um, we're looking, we were like, like looking at different seeds of different plants. So you can see on the top right that they were making like different types of seeds. Um, we also kind of looked at uh, tumor pots. So as I kind of said, um, pepper pots and tumor pots is like the traditional kind of one pot dish. Um, and originally they were all cooked in clay pots, but obviously that tradition has been lost over time as fewer and fewer people were making clay pots. Um, and so we were kind of looking at how, you know, what kind of, what were the different types of tumor pots, different kinds of forms of tumor pots that were made before or that they would like to make now. So one of the ideas is also to use kind of traditional forms, but potentially uh, develop those traditional forms into new different designs uh, and, and forms. Um, and yeah, and looking at different designs that they could put on them. And so obviously things like peppers. So Latia, for example, she uh, in her kind of kitchen garden grows about 10, 12 different types of peppers or chili peppers. And so she's like really interested in different types of chilies and peppers. So a lot of her work would depict for example, uh, ingredients that she would be using in her own cooking. Um, obviously fish, as I said to you before, fishing is like a big um, livelihood activity. 60% of Makushi diet is based on fish. Um, and so they have, you know, many, many different types of fish that they catch and eat uh, at different times in the, in the year, wet season, dry season, from different kinds of ponds, rivers, creeks, whatever it might be. And so fish really also are very important. And you can see on the tiles that are on the right-hand side at the bottom, this, this tile showing the arapaima, which is, um, what, which is uh, the, one of the world's, or the world's, I think, uh, largest freshwater fish. Um, it's like a really humongous, it's like the size of a table basically. Um, and it, it's so big that it has to come out of the water to breathe. Um, it can't, it, it has to do that every now and then, a bit like a kind of like, it looks like a mini dolphin coming out of the river. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of different forms that they were making based on their kind of lives and lived realities. Um, and then what we did after that was that we fired the pieces. Um, and as you can see here, uh, this was their kiln. Um, actually, this kiln design 
uh, this kiln actually, we, we basically destroyed this kiln because when we fired it, it took us 16 hours to put, every, well, we put everything in and it took us 16 hours to fire this kiln. Um, and it got to such a high temperature because we were trying to reach a particular temperature um, that it all got destroyed and one of the chimneys fell down the next day and half of the back wall fell down too. Um, and since then, just to say that um, I, I helped to design a new uh, kiln and they've rebuilt the kiln, not this design, a, a different design, which is much more efficient. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that was quite an endeavor was just um, spending like the whole night firing this kiln because we had to go and collect the wood in preparation for that and, and fire it all night. Um, and then we had an exhibition at the end of the, of the, set of the workshop or, or the time that I spent with them. Um, and yeah, this we had it outside, um, outside the library in the in the local village, um, and yeah, we had lots of really good um, feedback. as well of it and how you label them and how you kind of almost like how you kind of do a mini curation of an exhibition was something that we also did some work on before this exhibition. Um, yeah. <laughs> Um, so just to, um, just to, oh, sorry, go back to, to that episode, um, just to say that it's also um, an important thing that I did as um, part of the um, project was also um, trying to evaluate how things were changing for the potters and, you know, whether, what kind of impact the project had on them. Um, and I think there were some really important things. Uh, a lot of the, a lot of the things that they were making before, um, much based on other people's ideas. Um, and I think there was a lot of, um, I don't want to call it imposition because I think people are always doing it quite good. It normally do it with a good heart in terms of saying, oh, well, look at this, you should make something like this. But a lot of the, a lot of the, comments or the, the lot of the kind of help that they got before was very much about making things that other people made or trying to copy things that other people had made. Um, and I think one of the things that I know from the work that I do as an academic was that, you know, you really have to start with what people already have and the good things that they have already and try to work on that um, rather than trying to tell them to, you know, copy somebody else or do it as someone else does it. Um, and so I think it really helped to build their confidence as well. One of the big issues was that they didn't have a lot of confidence in their own skills and their own knowledge. And I think one of the important things was about that. And I think people really saw the fact that actually, you know, making and developing the pottery is not just about selling it to tourists or to sending stuff to Georgetown, even though that is one of one of the goals of this project, um, but it's also to um, revive the use of pottery within the communities themselves. So like, you know, there's this whole thing about the tumor pots and, you know, just from the exhibition, a lot of the community and, and people from other areas around there who came were already kind of asking them, asking the potters to make tumor pots for them. So that was just really nice. It was really nice to see how the local community were also responding themselves to, to you know, of this kind of revival in pottery. Okay, um, so one of the things that I had to produce as part of this project for the British Council uh, was a book. Um, this was my first lockdown labour of love um, in terms of being able to do this. So I did this work last year, this time last year, basically, in terms of being in Guyana. Luckily, I, I got back from Guyana and when I arrived home, it was like the next week we went into lockdown here. So I, I, I managed to do this work just before, so I was very lucky. Um, but then I spent um, a lot of the summer uh, putting this book together and the aim of this book, which is basically a collaborative sketchbook. So all the potters had their own sketchbooks um, that they had that they worked on during the time that I was there. Very much encouraged the sketchbook to be the kind of center of what they their creative practice. So they would sketch things. They would put all their designs on it every day. We would have reflections on what we had done during the day and they would write things in their sketchbooks or take photos. And then I would print the photos out and they would stick their photos inside their sketchbooks. Um, and so this, this particular book that I've put together is really a collaboration with their sketches and their ideas with kind of some of my thoughts and reflections on, on what happened during that, um, during the, during the workshop. Um, and then as part of, I suppose, you know, um, I 
was very much inspired by my experience with the was um and so when i got back home um at the start of lockdown i went and dug some of my own clay um there's a pit not far from me um where i managed to find some so i dug my own clay um and i processed it um myself and then yes and then i started making some pieces that were actually inspired by my uh time with them um so just here's a few uh, examples of of things that I've been inspired by, particularly you know different forms, um, a lot of the a lot of the fish, things like you know spirits, um, tree spirits, and things like that. So a lot of I mean not enough time to speak about all the different aspects of the stuff that uh, kind of you know that they were working on, but there's a lot of things that I'm was very much inspired by their their experiences. So that's kind of like informing a lot of my practice at the moment i'm making a whole series of pieces that um, were from inspired by my uh, experience with them um and i think that's i just like to say thanks for the opportunity to um talk about my project today um and um if you'd like to buy a copy of the book i'm doing a plug right now um support the potters all the proceeds go back to the potters uh it's eight pounds Donations are also welcome. Everything's, I'm trying to raise some funds to help them in terms of, yeah, just getting them going in terms of this, this new activity for them. Um, and there's my contact details down at the bottom. So thank you everyone. Thanks for taking the time to listen. Wonderful, thank you so much, Jay. Um, I'm sure everybody really enjoyed that. Um, I'm going to ask, I don't know if, if people have got um, some comments, but Jay, maybe you could put <clears throat> that information into the chat um, so that people could just copy it onto their, um, their own laptops or phones or whatever. Um, and I don't know if anybody had any particular questions, but I was interested in, in what's the sort of youth take up on it? I mean, did you find it's mostly the older generation um, that were interested in reviving these skills or... Is, is there a big take up amongst the youth as well? Jay, did you hear the question? No, I didn't hear you. I, I, I kind of lost you there. Sorry. Oh, OK, no, don't worry. That's that's fine. It's actually I've, I'm having um, problems with my computer today. It's got really bad um, uh, connection. But um, the question was, I was just I was just interested to find out if there was much youth take up. I mean, was was it? In terms of people interested in um, reviving their skills, is it? Do you find it's mostly the older generation, or are, are the younger generation as interested? Yeah, I would say I, I would say it's a bit of a mix, really. Um, I suppose you know uh, you you could see from the pictures there. I mean, the six potters that I worked with were a big age range, you know, from kind of like Combretson was was I think in his late forties all the way to Janet, who's seventeen. So I think there's quite a big mix there. I think. Um, there is an issue in terms of you know in within indigenous communities that a lot of the young people you know don't necessarily want to carry on doing some of the some of the activities that you know older people are doing um but i think it it really i think it a lot of that is to do with having pride in your own kind of culture and it's really that and i think part of the work that i do in my day job as, as I was saying before, as an academic, I'm actually currently working on a big project in Guyana, looking at how traditional knowledge can better inform um, policy at the national level. And a lot of that is about valuing and strengthening um, traditional knowledge. And I think as young people see the value of their own Um, Jay, I think you, you've frozen. I don't know if that's my computer or your computer. Um, but you seem to have frozen. I guess we can ask you some questions um, a bit later. Um, I'm just going to see who's chatting because we need all the... I'm just going to turn some people on to um, mute. Here we go. Perfect, Rod's just done it. Put somebody on mute, perfect. Um, Jay, if you're hearing me again, do carry on. 
Um, I didn't. I, I think I, I answered your question about the young people. I don't know if you had another one. Yeah. I so I think you were you you then started talking about the um, having an impact on government policy in terms of the way that indigenous art is is represented and viewed by the overall population. Is that what you you were sort of yeah. mentioning that that was your next project? At the moment, um, that's been running for a couple of years. Um, It's funded by the can better inform policies at the government level. So, for example, you know, the, the government's making a lot of policies in terms of, for example, cons con conservation, development, culture. Um, and, you know, Indigenous people don't necessarily get a big say in that. And their knowledge is not always acknowledged as part of that. So it's kind of like, how do you get more of that information? How do you get more of that knowledge, that local knowledge into, into government policy? So that's kind of what I'm working on at the moment in a bigger, as part of my academic work um, with this kind of, uh, the pottery stuff is like, also I'm working on that too, but that's kind of like not my day job. Uh, it's more of my passion kind of thing, I suppose, okay. yeah. So if, if um, you know, like a lot of the listeners on here, I mean, I can see from the comments that people uh, finding the project really interesting, interested. Um, in, where can they actually go to find out more about the project? But also, is there any way that we can help? Or, you know, there's, um, I know there's a community in Scotland, um, and I know this is going to sound very, it, it's going to sound um, unexpected, perhaps, but there's a, a community in Scotland that's really interested in helping support Indigenous art and um, just the community in Guyana as a whole. And um, I haven't been able to put forward any suggestions as to how they can, you know, obtain um, some of their artwork or their crafts or their hammocks or, you know, all that sort of thing. Do you know if, if there's anything we can do to actually purchase items from here? Um, well, uh, I could, I can definitely get you in contact with, so, you know, like I said, they, they are actually represented by a, like a, they've set up a social enterprise mm. within the community, which is called Wabani. And they kind of are the umbrella organization that's looking after all the craft makers. So that includes cotton weavers, for example, to make hammocks and various other things that they make, um, furniture makers, um, and then weavers as well, like basketry weavers. So they do a lot of very kind of beautiful different types of basketry stuff as well, and, and including the and including the potters as well. Mm. So yeah. So I mean, if you if we if you get in touch with me, or we keep in in, in touch, um, I'll drop you an email and I can kind of show you or let you know how how that could be taken forward. But yeah. definitely, I think, you know, in terms of kind of supporting this particular project in terms of the potters, um, you know, it's the least developed of all the craft making at, um, initiatives that are going on there. So it in a way needs quite a lot of support at this early stage to keep yeah. people interested and motivated. And as you know, in terms of all of these kinds of things that, you know, just one offs are not, are not really good enough in terms of building kind of capacity and interest and motivation. To keep going so it really needs some sustained support um it you know because there's a lot of work that the potters have to do to kind of um you know you, you know for example i just ring, pick up the phone and order my clay and it arrives at home you know they have to go and dig it you know and and process it and it's like a huge job that they spend a lot of of time doing you know and that time they're doing that they it's taken away from for example working on their farms going fishing the things that they need for feeding themselves so in a way they don't have any compensation for that so what I'm trying to do is like almost like build up some funds that would help to give them some small compensation to go and do that kind of work um, that is not just about making but also the whole process of, of pottery you know which is like it's huge you know like I said you know we we're very we don't rely on going to get our resources to make our things you know we just have to get any you know if we're painting we get our paints if we get whatever you know get our canvas they have to go and find every single material that they're going to use themselves and that's quite a long procedure to do that so yeah it's just kind of like trying to find um supporters for that okay well um i'm just gonna have a look somebody Alison Wright saying what's the name of the project 
I'm guessing, is it glazed expressions or no? Um, glazed expressions is my Instagram page. Right. Um, and the project is just, it's it's a crafting futures project. Crafting um, okay. Yeah, so it's a crafting futures project. But if anyone's interested, and I'll, I put my details in the chat already, but just get in touch with me um, and yeah. I'd be happy to tell you more about the project. Um, and if anyone's, I saw that a couple of people were interested in getting the book, then I'd be happy to give them the book as well or sell them the book, yeah. Yeah, um, obviously a lot of people are saying that it was it was very interesting. Um, and I've got here, Judith is saying, please tell us more about the tumor pot and the pepper pot. Yeah, I, I think, you know, for me, the tumor pot and the pepper pot, um, I don't know. I think kind of going back to what Marissa was talking about before, I feel like food is such a central thing of so many cultures. You know, it's it's like it's like the heart of 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 cultures. You know, everything revolves around food, cooking, making, growing, whatever it might be. And that's exactly the same for indigenous communities. You know, they they grow their food in their farms, they collect they collect foods from the forest and the savanna, then they have very intricate preparation because you know they they their, their staple is cassava which, and a lot of them, they have the sweet cassava and they have the bitter cassava, but the bitter cassava has to be strained to take the kind of poisonous juices out of that before they can use it. And then they make farine, they make tapioca, they make so many different products and a lot of beverages, all the alcoholic drinks they make are from cassava, fermented, you know. And so they have a lot of, a lot of stuff is around food and then the fishing and the hunting and all of that, that goes together. And the tumor pot almost for me is like, the kind of representation of their whole culture and life and everything because you know the tumor pot is where you you throw all those things inside you know and you just let it boil up and you put a bit of kazarip inside and you know and it it just yeah it's, it's just it's just brilliant and so it kind of like i think the tumor pot and the pepper pots they kind of exemplify the life of of indigenous people i think mm. um so yeah that's for me that's what that's what the tumor pot's about and i think you know with a lot of indigenous people being subject to different kinds of diets you know new or i don't want to call them necessarily new diets but a lot of diets based on non non-indigenous foods such as cassava so you know you've got like um diabetes and various other kinds of illnesses actually increasing a lot in these communities that never used to have these issues before and a lot of it's to do with diet and the change of diet so actually going back to using tumor pots and what tumor pots and pepper pots represent, you know, that fresh, that kind of, you know, um, traditional kind of foods and ingredients, I think in that way is also really important for health as well as eating. So I think it's all connected, you know, and I, and I think that's in, in indigenous culture, everything is connected, you know, culture is connected to nature. There's no separation between the two. So I think that's kind of, for me, the tumor pot and the pepper pot kind of exemplifies that. I think from the um, images that you're showing, is the tumor pot always done, at, is, is there like a round pot, isn't it? Yeah, it can have different shapes because okay. some can be quite shallow. So you can get quite shallow tumor pots or you can get the big wide open mouthed tumor pots. Yeah. And just curious, have you tried, so does it taste different? You know, like, so I've, I've noticed that a lot of foods cooked in clay pots, almost taste, I mean, they have a different taste to them when they're cooked in a, you know, yeah. a pan. Yeah, I definitely think so. Um, <laughs> but maybe I'm biased, but I definitely think so. But, you know, I at the exhibition that we had, and we had so many people who came to the exhibition, they were all saying, oh, I just remember my my mom. I just remember my granny cooking in the clay tumor pot. It was so, the food was so good. It just doesn't taste so, doesn't taste the same anymore and stuff like that. And I think there was a lot of that kind of like memories of you know of other people cooking and and I think someone just put a comment there about slow cooking as well I think it's that whole thing of really enjoying the process of of cooking food and eating food I think is also exemplified I think by tumor pots and pepper pots um so yeah yeah no somebody else is saying they agree I think that's Michelle agree also saying when cooked on fireside compared to new cookers <laughs> yeah. yeah um all right so um Jay I think that's fantastic uh so everybody just check out the links that she's put um in the chat um she's also added her email um address so uh Jay ceramics at myphone.coop which is fantastic. 
Um, and I'm sure we'd love to we'd love to have you back probably just to give us an update on how the project's going actually it's, it could sound so so brilliant yeah well I just I just to say that I do have um Absolutely. British Council yeah. very kindly gave me some extra money that was hurrah yeah, yeah. Um, um, and I'm hoping to go there again sometime this year so fingers crossed when uh the world pandemic situation gets better I will be able to go back sometime this, this year to do a bit more work with them so it'll be brilliant fantastic Thank you so much. And I'm sure everybody's putting their hands together to give you a round of applause, although you can't see it because most of them are behind screens. But um, thank you so much. And I hope you'll stay on to hear awesome. the remainder. Brilliant. Thanks um, very much. Thank you, Joe. Thank you. So we're going to move on now. Um, just one reminder. I know a few people have just joined us. So just a reminder again to please um, be on mute. Um, because we can hear you and it just disturbs the um, recording. Um, so our next performer, I should say our next speaker is Zakia McKenzie. Um, it's really nice actually to have Zakia on because we've had her father on before. Rex McKenzie did a fantastic um, overview for us on um, oil in, in Guyana. Um, I, think, I think the program was called What Will Oil Do for Guyana? So um, it's fantastic Zakia to welcome you. Um, just so that everyone's aware, Zakir was born in South London in the late 1980s to a Guyanese dad and a Jamaican mum. She grew up in Kingston but returned to England in 2014 and is currently living in Bristol. Zakir is a storyteller and is writing a PhD on West Indian, the West Indian newspaper in the UK. She was the 2019 Forestry England uh, Writer in Residence and her 2018 master's degree looked at the environmental and social implications of Guyana's petroleum discovery. Um, Zakir has also been a volunteer at Ujima 98 FM Community Radio in Bristol since 2015. So Zakir, a really warm welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Hi, everyone. Thanks. I'm really happy to be here today. Thank you. Zakir, I saw your dad just popped into the room, so I know he's here to watch you. <laughs> I'm nervous now. I'm very nervous. He's watching. <laughs> nervous, right? <laughs> but yeah, so tell, tell us a little bit um, about yourself. I mean, have you been writing poetry a lot? I mean, you've done poetry in, uh, you said you're a writer in residence at Forestry England. What was that kind of project about? So that was uh, Forestry England, it was the 100th year and they just did this project of having two writers for the year. And I just happened to be one of them and just spent a year visiting the different uh, national forests or forests that Forestry England holds and kind of writing and reflecting on, you know, just my experiences in the different environmental spaces and the things I kind of liked. It was, it was a great year. Yeah, it was a great year because I don't think I would have explored England any other way yeah was it like a competition or something like how did they how did you get it was it? was there was an application process i think there were about a thousand people that applied and there were only two of us that got it so that's fantastic congratulations yeah. so you. i guess i guess it was mostly about writing about the environment in the uk it was, um, but definitely for me, my writing about the UK is always about writing about the UK's legacy in the Caribbean and in South America. Okay. So, you know, I think what the collection that came, I don't think it was what was expected because a lot of it was just about um, our people in this chat's relationship with the land and relationship with England. Um, but it is, it's British nature writing because it's England's legacy in the Caribbean and our work moving here. So, you know, it, I think it all fits. It's, it's, it's my, my British experience. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And so um, have you spent a lot of time in Guyana or mostly in Jamaica then? Or? So I went when I was younger. I think I went when I was about five or six and I haven't been back. And, you know, I think it's, it's I always say that, um, and I can't say it's here because we're Guyanese, but living in Jamaica, it, it kind of overcrowds everything else. You know, you, you, you forget a lot of other things. 
Um, and so for me, a lot about being Guyanese was when I left. It was when I was in New York and when I was in, uh, you know, coming back here. So a lot of that for me now is, a lot, you know, a lot of the things I write now is about that discovery and also finding the connections in the lands between Jamaica and Guyana and all the different Caribbean islands and territories out there. So um, a question from uh, Karenia, she just wants to know, what is the name of the nature collection? It's just called Forestry, uh, Forest Collection, and um, I can put a link to it after. It's on the Forestry uh, Commission of England's website. If you just search Forestry England and my name, it should come up. Uh, there are about four, uh, five or six pieces in it. Okay, fantastic. And then um, just one last comment. Um, I'll just share with you is from Carol Wright. She's saying, hey, hey, Zakir, big up. <laughs> so, yeah, which sounds like a good time to, to let you um, introduce your poetry to us. Okay, so I decided I'm not doing the poem. I'm doing a bit of prose today uh, because I think it fits a lot. And it's about, uh, can I share my screen quickly? Just to... Yeah, I think so. I think I have you on. Um, as a co-host let me just double check yeah you should be as a co-host that's at the moment but i'll start telling you about um some i'm talking I've, I've written this story about a tree uh which is the national tree of jamaica national uh national flower of jamaica national tree of bahamas and it's called a lignum in jamaica we call it lignum vitae in England, they would say lignum vitae. In Jamaica, we just say lignum vitae, yeah. right? And the thing is, this tree does not exist much anymore. Um, I can't show you my screen. I, I want to show you what. I'm, I, I'm not sure why it's not working because it's it's just got chat, stop video spotlight for everyone. It's green. Um, putting away some. Yeah, it's not. It's for some reason it's not allowing me to put you as co-host. But let me just see if I take somebody else off. Maybe it'll it'll do yeah, that. Click off change. All right. Um, so the lignum vitae tree is, as I said, it used to be one of the most poly prolific trees in the Caribbean. And what struck me in, in finding out about, and not only the Caribbean actually, Central America and South America, all over the kind of English speaking, um, the, the Americas, not just the English speaking parts. And the thing about it, it was so prolific, uh, it's, it was everywhere, uh, maybe two, 300 years ago, and now we have very little of it. So I did a bit of research to find out about this tree, and here's the story I've written about Lignum Vitae. And in it, the character, um, the character who we're hearing from, I can share my screen now. I think we can see now, right? Yes, we can see it. Perfect. Excellent. So here we are. Um, so it's called Guayacom. I, I think it's not by surprise that the name sounds like Guyana because this is one of the places where they suspect that it actually came from and then traveled um, up into the Caribbean, the Windward and the Leeward Islands, and then up in South and Central America. Um, so uh, all species of it right now are listed as endangered. So it is a tree that's just not there anymore. My story is from the point of view of a man who we expect to be an Englishman who was on these ships many years ago that brought a lot of lignum vitae. And this is him kind of reflecting, almost sorrowful, but we're not sure if he's sorry for it. Um, and, you know, I think Jay just said, that for her, the Tuma part represents the culture of indigenous people. And for me, this tree represents a lot about uh, the Caribbean's legacy with Britain. I hesitate to mourn the loss of my dear friend, Lignum Vaiti, because he is not gone. We tend to think of the dead as those to be planted in the ground, buried to start a new type of existence underground. This was the opposite for my dear friend, Lignum Vitae. It was when they took him from the ground that he began his death. It has always continued since, but Lignum Vitae is still here. Even if he's just a ghost, a dark shadow in an even darker forest, suffering a perpetual centuries long death. I will continue to invoke their old Lignum Vitae for his legacy is in this land. This, our friend Lignum Vitae, endured a long and tough life. He helped to build the world as we know it, but is, no, but is now no more than a mere murmur, forgotten on every side of the Atlantic. I know it is true that we only speak of the great things people do after their glorious prime, but Lignum Vitae was abused and overlooked more dead than alive. 
For to acknowledge that he was unjustly treated would be to admit that everything else was wrong about it too. Our dear friend Lignum Vitae was heavier than water. Despite this, he was present on many of our empire's greatest ships. He was chosen because of his extreme density. He was well oiled and always ready to work. He made the shaft, the rudders, and these did not weather or jam. He is an essential part of our shipbuilding industry. Yes, the basis of England's expansion was bolstered by him. Once he was found in a new world, he would never stay in one place again. No doubt when Blackbeard and Henry Morgan sang, she, sang sea shanties with their crews, Lignum Vitae heard them so many times that he knew all the words too. He never told me the truth. Too ashamed of his browbeaten history, too scared, maybe he was too scared that maybe he was complicit. But our dear friend Lignum Vitae probably sailed back to Europe with Columbus on that very first voyage. He went on to sail the seven seas. Lignum Vitae was known everywhere because of his prowess on the waters. Sadly, he went around the world bringing people and products in a way he never consented to. Still, he was the strongest of them all, the most dedicated and reliable. So hard that he would blunt saws and axes, so sharp he was employed to cut diamonds. Lignum Vitae made the dead eyes, the bull eyes, the sheaves, the wheels of pulleys, the belaying pills, the bushings, the ballast for some of the greatest slaving ships of centuries past. Many times he traveled back and forth between Britain and its colonies, bringing sugar, coffee, bananas, tobaccos, black people, Indian people, blood. Every other slaving nation hired him out. The English, the Dutch, the French, everybody. The living dead carrying the living dead. Every part of the Americas was hunted for the will and wood of Lignum Vitae. He too was forced to work from field to great house. Our dear friend Lignum Vitae had no mouth to say no. Lignum Vitae always laughed at how they thought him some magical bush doctor using him to treat syphilis as early as the 1500s in that wild European epidemic. He learned, he earned the name Pockwood for they thought that he would cure the pox. Speaking of venereal disease, our dear friend met Charles Dickens too. So taken aback was Dickens by the fortitude of our forgotten friend that he created a character called Lignum Vitae or Matthew Bagnett in his book Bleach, Bleak House in 1852. Lignum Vitae became world renowned for his fortitude. To this day, he is called the wood of life. And it is he who birthed much of modern Britain. Our dear friend Lignum Vitae survived for more than 400 years being overused like this. He must have felt felled and broken a thousand times over. Lignum Vitae is slow growing. It takes a long time to heal. He hasn't fully recovered and maybe he never will. Where he once lived in thick, full forest, now that all remains is a vast, empty field of overuse. But he never really died. The landscape of England has little pieces of him all over, tiny fragments that hardly warrant a record in a museum, but without but without which everything would fall apart. Our dear friend Lignum Vitae has gone from dust to dust, yet I still find it hard to mourn the loss, for he was always the living dead when he traveled to this land, from full forest patches and to ashes, from the Caribbean to dirt in England. Thank you. Wow, that was fantastic, Zakia, I loved it. Thank you. Amazing. Um, I'm just going to look in the chat because I can see um, June, Giovanni. Oh, Greer says one love from Blaze. Thank you, Auntie Greer and Uncle Blaze. Big up. You, you guys are the reason why I'm here right now. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, June Giovanni just said it's so enriching and so informative. Uh, thank you. Clover is smiling. 
um marion writes is amazing so beautiful yeah i mean just you can you can read them corinne is like wow fantastic i love that line about how his death began when he was taken from the soil um Thank yeah, you. that's that's really interesting. I, I I didn't know you'd mentioned the bit about syphilis, and I know that syphilis was rife in Guyana in like the I don't know like seventeenth and eighteenth century. What, was the tree actually used as a curative? Could it actually? So I mean, everything I said is a fact. You know, even though it's a story, this is the history of how lignum vitae was used over the years. So it really is expected that lignum vitae went back to England with, I mean, went back to Spain with Columbus and was almost immediately uh, used for syphilis and all, all venereal diseases until I think it's about 17 something where they actually get penicillin and they're like, oh, this, you know, this lignum vitae thing actually might not work for what we have going on here. Um, this is over, you know, 300 years or four, you know, that they're using lignum vitae for many things. It was like a big medicine um in england and, and and kind of all over europe actually it, it had so many uses and um you know one thing i didn't mention is that we hear about mahogany we hear about ebony because these are the pretty woods you know these are the pretty ones the shiny ones lignum vitae was used for kind of decorative purposes but more chances you know more than not it was used for work it was used in labor it was used for the slave ships it was used for police buttons um it was used for every single game of uh, bowls, bowling, uh, cricket, lignum vitae was used to develop these things for, for England without, you know, we have to wonder if lignum vitae wasn't there, what would have happened? What would have happened if this tree didn't exist for them to use and exploit when they found it? Yeah, yeah, and it does it, I mean, what's the kind of the local word? Was it the, you, you're saying it's like Guyana or also it sounded like Guyana, is that the local what? term? So the name, the original, the scientific name for it is Guayacum, right? And um, and this is this was the original name as well. And sometimes it's spelled in a way that almost looks like Guyana. Yeah. And, you know, we suspect that the name, you know, we suspect that the names are related because of where they might the tree might have been identified first in those kind of European uh, environmental excursions. Yeah, so um, just to, re to read a few of the comments again, Corinne is saying the connection of trees and plants to the slave trade, colonialism, and the Q connect connection are so fascinating. Um, they contain so much history in their migration. Yeah, Absolutely. and uh, Scott Tingit Key is kind of saying the same thing, the power of nature and history and um, literature. And um, I have to ask you another question because Rod, uh, who's my husband, who helps me with the technical side of things here, is a complete and obsessive Dickens fan. And I yeah. saw he, he, um, he was like, oh, bleak house. Yeah. So um, I think his question is, did the Dickens character reflect the qualities of the Lingen Vitae? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So I didn't, so this is just an extract that I read, but um, the character is called Matthew Bagnet, and it's, and this is a quote, in complement to the extreme hardness and toughness of his physiognomy, right? So the hardness and the toughness, the oh. grammatical hardness and toughness would in the world. Oh, but, wow. <laughs> the thing, what, what kind of struck me about it, everyone knew Lignum Vitae so much that it was written about, yeah. not just some. Um, you know, not just Dickens, Cromwell had a thing with, you know, everybody, the American uh, Civil War, there was lignum vitae being used to make the kind of war, the, 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 the guns and the mullets, it's, that's what we call it, muskets, right? So it was kind of used all over for these different, and, and since writing this, I found it in even more literature, even more literature, I find, I found it kind of just around, and I think it's so funny that we don't speak about it now, you know, I, I can guess why we don't. Yeah. Um, if uh, a few people have just joined, could you please put your audio on mute? Um, but yeah, Zakir, thank you so much for that. That was really, really fascinating. And I, I think um, one of the things we forget is that, you know, like even in, in a lot of the English literature, you can kind of find the presence of the black community and, and of the Caribbean within the literature, you know, like if, well, I guess if, if we'd been reading uh, Bleak House, we wouldn't have picked up on that. 
uh, because we didn't know, you know, previously didn't know about the um, relationship of the, um, the tree to the Caribbean. So yeah, thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, Zakir, can you take your um, your details off share at the moment? Yeah, can I just actually mention, so this uh, story is in this book called The Wild Isle, just out in a few months. Oh, this is coming out. Oh, fantastic. It's an extract and it's in, a, it's in an anthology here and, you know, it's an anthology of British nature writing which is quite interesting. Mine is the only one that's from this kind of perspective. And a little bit after that, I have a pamphlet with Rough Trade Books, which is a similar kind of writing style, but it's about the invasion of Jamaica. So it's uh, about 1655 and Jamaica and the Spanish battling, uh, yeah, uh, the British and the Spanish battling for Jamaica, the kind of Maroons as well. So that's coming out soon. Okay, fantastic. Well, congratulations. And, and actually, just before you go, um, Zakir, can you just tell us a little bit about what your PhD is? I, I, you know, I was just kind of curious to know a bit more about what you were doing and researching. Yeah, so my PhD is in a project called the Caribbean Literary Heritage Project, and my specific uh, uh, writing is on new, so, uh, you know, so funny you guys guys had um you know i've been coming to your, your meetings and seeing all the people i'm writing about right you've seen all the people i'm writing about for so long so i'm writing about newspapers in uh britain in the 50s and 60s and 70s so everything that's before the voice because we all know the voice what happened before the voice you know and bringing back some of those names just you know big one is hansi being my name you know i was able to see uh here a few weeks ago so yeah. yeah. Okay, so you know um, to go to the Black Cultural Archives. Absolutely, yeah. It's just, <laughs> just COVID that cancelled all my trips so far, but I'm making, I kind of got some of my, my, you know, I got some of the things in and making use of what I have. Yeah, yeah. And um, you, you, I'm sure you'd be able to find um, things at New Beacon Books as well in the, the George Padmore Institute they have there. Yeah, yeah. So I, I got some things before COVID and I mean, if anyone is here and knows, you know, more about any and want to get in contact about either of the topics, I would really love to know more because I think there's such a lot to recover from what, what people know and the stories that people have in their, in their hearts from their homes and stuff like that. So it, it might be interesting for you to link up with um, Claudia Tomlinson. I think she's doing a PhD at Chichester University, okay. um, but I think she's doing her PhD on Jessica Huntley. Okay. Um, yeah, who What's her name again? Um, Claudia Tomlinson. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but that's fantastic. So um, I'm just going to check if there's any more questions. I don't think there was any questions. Um, June says, thank you, Zakir. We'll look for your writings via your website. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Carol Wright says, I'll be in touch about this, the West Indian world. So yeah. And that was one of the old newspapers, yeah. So um, yeah, everybody's, I'm sure, putting their hands together for you. And I really appreciate you coming on. Um, I'd love you to come on again another time because we didn't get, we want to hear some of your poetry as well. <laughs> so thank you, Zakir. And I'm going to move now to um, actually Errol Brewster, who is online. Um, and, uh, but we did a pre-recording. Um, um, where I was sort of trying to interview him while I was getting, he told me off a lot of times, so, you know, <laughs> you'll see in the recording. Um, um, I can, well, actually I won't unmute um, Errol at the moment because I'm going to show you the, the video first, but um, just so that you have, uh, if you don't already know a lot about Errol, he's a Caribbean um, artist from Guyana living in the United States. Um, he has more than four decades of Caribbean-wide multimedia imaging uh, practice, and he's participated in multiple Carifestas, the EU's Centro Cultural uh, Carifora, I think it's called Carifora, maybe I'm saying it incorrectly, um, Between the Lines, which is a traveling exhibition in 2000, um, and also the first international triennial of Caribbean art in 2010, and the Inter-American Development Bank's Sidewalks of the Americas installation in 2018. So um, Errol, thank you very much for allowing me to interview you. Um, Errol and I had originally decided that we were only gonna talk for 30 minutes, but actually 
we went on for about an hour and 15 minutes. So I'm going to share the first um, 30 minutes of the recording just so that, um, to allow you to then um, ask any questions that you might have. But I'm going to put the actual recording on YouTube and also on the Guyana Speaks page so that you can watch the remainder of it. And actually, the first half is it, we're just sort of chatting about his work. And then the second half, which I won't show here, but that you will be able to see, we look at um, particular paintings and he, um, particular pieces of work um, that, um, yeah, that Errol then, we kind of discuss in a bit more detail. So he talks about the technique and, and things like that. And I can see we've now got Errol on screen. Uh, Errol, I think you're not on mute. So say hello and... Greetings to everyone. Hi, hi. Hi, hi. Hi, hi, hi. Pleased hi. to be here. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. And um, uh, you'll notice um, Errol's got this uh, poster in the background called the Momola. And um, I know that you're selling that actually, aren't you? Are you, are you selling copies of that, that poster? Yeah. Do you want to tell everybody how they can get hold of it? I am. Well, you need to email me at errol.brewster9 at gmail.com and I'll give you the details then. It's very simple, really. Um, you tell me your email address and your home address, and I send the file to a Walgreens near you. So you can go there the very next day, pay $17.11. Uh, that is the price now. It's sometimes lower, sometimes they offer a 40% discount and get the poster. Okay, so that's for the benefit of everybody in the States. Did you follow that? I, I followed that, yeah, that, that uh, they should email you. Yes, only in the States. Yeah, and it's only in the States, unfortunately. Um, Errol, before um, I move on to the video, just a quick random question. You actually told me off for not asking you this question during the interview, so I'm gonna ask you now, um, what are you reading at the moment? Oh, right. There it is. Uh, Mac was a family friend of my family. I greatly admired him. So when I found out that Rosie had written this book, I had to have it. So I'm going through it right now. Thank you so, thank you so much, Rosie. <laughs> so yeah, that's a book that's written by Rosie McAndrew. And I believe you can get it on Amazon. Um, the details will anyway be available on uh, Guyana Speaks page. So uh, definitely it's worth buying. It's a fantastic book. In fact, I'm currently reading it <laughs> and I'm up to here. I haven't finished it yet, but yeah, I definitely recommend that you all um, buy it. It's really, it's really well written. Um, so I'm going to move on now and um, I'll put, for because I, I, I can see in the chat that people are asking for Errol's um, email address again, and I will put it in the I'll chat. Write it. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in the chat for you. And meantime, I'm going to share the recording of the um, interview that we did. So um, here we go. So I, we're not listening to this. Oops, hang on. No, I know, I know. I need to bring it down to size. And then I can go again. Oops, oops, oops. Not yet, not yet. We're going to hear that again a bit later on. Here we go. So this is one. Um, just to remind everybody, please put yourselves on mute. Um, I can hear somebody. Let me just check. I'm just going to check. Myrtle, is it? I'm going to, I've just muted you and I'm looking to see, is anybody else? Okay, I think we're good now. So I'm going to press play. Errol Brewster, how wonderful. Thank you for joining us at Guyana Speaks today. Um, I think we're probably going to speak for about 30 minutes and I would just like to start with the first question which is, who is Errol Brewster? What a question. <laughs> morning to you, Juanita. Thank morning, you morning. <laughs> but that question is a very telling question. Because I, of course, 
have been trying to make a name for myself in the visual arts for 40 something years. That you feel the need to ask that question means I didn't have much luck. I didn't do very much. In <laughs> I didn't do good at all. But in these two minutes that you're allowing me here, I am going to launch myself on the world stage. Okay? Go for Let it. Let me tell you who that is. Harold Brewster is a gorilla. He's an art warrior. I love art. I love to talk about art. I love to make art. I've been making art since I was three years old. The most recent of my works I would like for you to play now. The Mamala. The Mamala. The Mamala. <laughs> yeah, Mamala. okay. Yes, I'm just going to... Go, you go for it, and then when you finish, I'll share the screen. Okay. The Mamala is a, is a public art intervention. I illegally and surreptitiously painted her portrait on a bus stand, on the side of a bus stand. It is a perforated uh, material so that you can see the portrait as well as you can see through to the inside of the bus stand. And the whole idea behind that is for people approaching the bus stand to see others like themselves in her image. So it's a celebration of a Caribbean sister that has acceded to the highest office. Huh? That's a significant thing. And so I felt the need to celebrate it. But guess what happened? No sooner was I finished, and I'm lucky that they waited until I was finished and they didn't pounce on me whilst I was doing it. They erased it by repainting it within 24 hours. But it had been my intention to repaint it myself. I intended to restore the bus stand to its original way because I know that I am doing something that I shouldn't be doing. What, is, what my objective really was, <laughs> was in making a film of doing so that I can put it out to the world. And I would like you to do that now so that you can get a sense of who this warrior, this guru, <laughs> This public art warrior, yes. <laughs> so here it goes. Now let me just lift up the screen and play. Come on, come on, come on, set me free. Come on, come on. Equal equality. Start playing, girl. Mama, not playing good, uh, Juanita. Everything is going to be all right now. End of an era. Not E R A, E R R O R. So, bring on the girls. <clears throat> Keep playing good on your screen, Juanita. Look around, your viewers. Really. Find this interesting and enjoy it. Understand that the, the authorities didn't. There was a there was an atrocious piece of graffiti on the other side without my understanding. They did not remove that. They removed the beautiful face of our vice president, who is going to change this country significantly. So this was actually after the inauguration, was it? This is on the very day. On the very day. Okay. And who is your partner in crime? So who's the there person? There is no partner. I'm not a passerby. It's all going by. I'm alone. I'm a lone warrior. Okay, so you set up a no camera partner. yourself. No partner. Okay. I'm gonna walk and don't look back. <laughs> all right. <laughs> I see art as social engineering. Really. But let me tell you about myself here. I, um, I was the last child in a family of four with very big brothers, brothers 16 years older than me. So that I got a lot of insight into what life was like at the way advance of my own maturity. But the thing that made me an artist, I think, is the fact that my father was a I don't know how we could describe him. He was, he was a highly aspirational, lower working class man. He was a civil servant and his economics did not afford us 
uh, the opportunity to live in a neighborhood or a community that he would have liked. And he felt that the community in the neighborhood that we lived in was not the right influence for me. And so I got part of the window. I could not go outside and play on the hand cricket and roll roller and play the ring of roses and watch the masquerade and things. I had to watch from the window. It made me into a keen observer. How would you describe it? into a documentarian. And it made me into a lifelong, a like a... diehard supporter of well, the underdog. He's, he's an eccentric. It doesn't alienate me. What's a Guyanese word you use to describe him? It made me embrace them. And so all of my work really is concerned with the struggles of ordinary people. Um, so, amongst so, the, Errol, amongst I, just wanna, the, I just want to say for the people who don't know, people like me, so you were brought up in Georgetown now. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm from Guyana. Yes, we know, we know you're from Guyana, we know you're from Georgetown. What <laughs> era are you, is this going on in? I mean, what, what are you talking well, about? The this is going on in a time when the, I was born in 1953. 53, this okay. is the beginning of the modern political period in Ghana. Right, and it right. has been tumultuous and full of turmoil ever since. I was a nine year old looking through the window and region street in my uncle's house as they burned down their own city, as they beat the hell out of each other, scrambling people off of their bicycles and beating the hell out of them. This is me at nine years old. This is what I'm witness to mm. in my family, like I tell you, for one thing, my, my father was um, the, the child of Barbadian immigrants. So we were not like fully integrated into Ghana. We didn't know anybody. We had no other relatives. We were a nuclear family. So my father and his brother, these two brothers married two sisters. So we were a very insular uh, kind of unit. And of course, though they were not um, involved in partisan politics, it was a concern of theirs. They paid very good attention. We had all the newspapers loved me along to all of the political meetings at Border Green. So I was fully politicized as a child. As a child, I'm highly politicized. That they were supporters of all of the parties in the family. So the discussion raged in, uh, about uh, the, the, the virtues or, or the problematic aspects of all of these parties. And I am, of course, attuned and listening to all of this. I don't know to, the, to what extent at the time I'm understanding it, but what it did was to give me a sensitivity the matters related to politics of the country. And so that has always been a base concern of mine. And you will see it in the work that I do. Um, <clears throat> uh, amongst, the, amongst the images that you have, there are several of them that are polit political images. There's the application, an old woman trudging along as a, a, a big crab emerges from the parliament building to swallow her up. These are not exaggerations. The government of the day let the palms, which is the home for the indigent, fall down itself. The city hall is now similarly falling down on itself. We have a weird attitude to ourselves. But I'm telling you about myself and how I came to this. I'm doing this since I was two years old. I have a cousin, Sandra. You wouldn't have to ask her, or if you did, you'd have to have a, a program of the last couple of hours if you asked her who she was. Because she's a very notable Canadian artist, <laughs> born in Canada, a Guyanese parent, but grown up, born and grown in, in, in Canada, and fully integrated into the, in, in the art scene. Has a wonderful career. What she is doing now, the transference of pictures from one surface to another, denoting all the sociological ramifications of that, is what I was doing when I was five years old. Of course, I had no sense of the sociological ramifications of anything. I was just transferring pictures. I love pictures. <laughs> And I was tired drawing them, I started transferring them from the newspaper. So, as I'm going along through my life making art, I tell you I have big brothers. They are in the theater guild, they are on the national basketball team, they're going to school with people like Wordsworth Macanzu, they're friendly with Stanley Greaves and Ron Savory, Dennis Williams is a friend of my family. So, art is uh, a part of my ambiance. So this idea of how, when did you decide to become a professional artist? I never decided that. I was an artist from, from, from the time I knew myself. Also, I didn't really have any sense of what a professional artist was. All of these artists, people whom I tell you about, they did other things. They were broadcasters or teachers or administrators or architects or whatever. Nobody was a professional artist who just did art and earned their living doing art. There was no, no, no such thing went on. Um, <clears throat> 
So <clears throat> I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't make a decision to be a professional artist. I was just an artist and I went along. When I graduated from high school, um, I did well in language and in literature and in history and in art and in mathematics. I could have gone in any direction within the liberal arts. But um, I decided I wanted to work because I wanted good friends. And I felt that if I had a job, the love. Some music is playing now, uh, Monita. What's going on? I'm not hearing anymore. Maybe it's my system. Are you guys hearing anything? Is it? Is the I'm I'm here. I'm hearing you. I'm just going to um. I'm just going to take somebody and put them in the waiting room because so, every now and then you get people who are just um, messing around. <laughs> Hang on. So actually, um, we'd let in accidentally because they weren't on the uh, invitation list. Hold on a second. Um, I'm just gonna stop the share and share it again so that we can, what are we on? One, eleven. 18 and then one, 16, two. Okay, just because there's something um, disturbing the screen. Hold on. Okay, so I'm going to start sharing the screen again. I'm supposed to be counting out the people's withdrawals and checking in their deposits, but I'm busy drawing the, the, the customers in the line. Of course, I'm making a lot of mistakes. So I got to stay back late in the night trying to get my tilt to balance. I said, listen, hey, let me finish with this thing. I can take off to art school. I could have gone to Jamaica. Jamaica had an art school. But I didn't think that Jamaica was a 24-hour society in which I could go to school in the day and work in the night. So, psh, off to Canada with 24 hours of society. I have family there. The same Sandra, her father is my cousin. So <clears throat> that is my launching pad. Set myself off and I'm at the art school. The art school I've been to, 100 year old art school. However, a year before I got there, they turned the whole pedagogical approach to teaching of art on its head. Through all of the nonsense of the school reinvented itself as a fully equipped school in a wide range of areas. You could do from stereography to holography. And so I took full advantage of that. And that is how it is that my work is expressed as drawing, painting, photography, film, computer graphics, design. That is, it is, it is a, as, a, as a direct result of the exposure to various media and approach. Uh, that that school gave me. <clears throat> so now I'm graduated from the school. I never got any scholarship. I never took any scholarship, but I returned home. This was a period in the 1970s when the government was giving out scholarships left, right, and center. Thousands of people took scholarship. What they wanted was for you to serve in the national service. I don't know what the hell is national service, standing up on a, on a drill straight, dressed up in a bullshit uniform with a, with a toy gun. No, no, no. I said to them, listen, the national service I would like to do is to paint murals on the children's, on the walls of the children's ward of the hospital, the public hospital. Send me to Mahaika, send me wherever you got your hospital. I will paint murals on the walls that will interest the children. No, 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 sir. We just need to you to uh, march around in that square. Say, hey. Keep your scholarship. <laughs> I need to do it. Very gone now. Painting, whatever it is I have to do to survive. But I returned all of the thousands who they gave their scholarship to who marched around and that was where they all disappeared into the metropolis. <laughs> I am back. What am I going to do? I'm like an astronaut now. I study in philosophy. These things that nobody in Guyana knows about. We have no materials to support it. We have, we have, we, we, 
We don't have electricity. We don't have bread. Bread. And he gives us a painting called Big Bread. <laughs> bread is such bread is a, is a big thing in the food science and line around the block to buy bread. So where are you going with technical photography? Where are you going with? But then you I teach in the art. And how this society is. Mm -hmm. Just out of an undergraduate college. She was third at the National Art School. What I know about teaching. I don't know a thing about teaching. You know what will happen? I'm going to head that art school. What I know about heading art school. Eh? I don't know nothing about heading art school, but I head in the art school. <laughs> I'm the head of the society. You're the head of people. You are the most modern people. You can do anything. So you put on my What's your next question? Well, one of the things I wanted to know is what's your, I mean, because you have a very varied approach to art. What's your favorite medium? You know, medium and technique and process are insignificant to me, really. The heartbeat of art is image. And that image has to arise out of a foundational idea. Philip Moore was a man who didn't care whether he had artist paints or house paints, because image is what it is. Image is the heartbeat of art. So I'm not concerned with what computer program you use. I show people myself what computer program you use. Come on, man, engage with the work. Where are you going with what computer program I'm using? What difference does it make? Corel Draw, Photoshop, Illustrator, what difference does it make? Image, that is where the art is at. It's, so it's, 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 it's interesting as well because I see you very much as a documentarian. I mean, I watched the I watched the film that you did on Philip Moore. And I, you know, I love that whole introduction with the sort of Afro-Guyanese culture and how it leads to this understanding of how coffee becomes produced, you know, his 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 style and his technique and stuff. I thought it was very um eye-opening. But I noticed you do a lot of you produce a lot of documentaries of other artists. I do. In, I, do. In I love art. I love to talk about art. I love to make art, but I don't talk too much about my own art. I'll talk about your art. Other people's art. I'm ready for that. With my art, I'm not talking. But you know, it's a, it's a bit, this whole idea of writing artist statement, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little curious about that because I am of the view that artists are not really able to examine themselves, to understand what are the influences that work in their own work. I don't think that um, artists have that high degree of self awareness that they could analyze their work and see in it what is influencing it and stuff. This idea of artist statements, I avoid things like artist statements and resume. And, uh, I just want the concentration on the work. I, I think that's, I, that's, that's why I wanted to hear you say who you were, because <laughs> I've seen a lot of people <laughs> write about you, but I've never really seen you write about yourself. Well, and, well, um, so I was interested in, in, in how you saw yourself. And I think it's why I mentioned to you the other day um, that I like the, there's a, I can't remember who wrote it, but somebody said resistance is a secret of joy and it's, well, a, it's a statement that stayed in my head for a long time because I've always seen you as a guerrilla artist um, <laughs> and and I, I sort of because of that I thought that you must have been so interested in politics that when you create you have something very definite that you want to say about a, the political context or the political times so I sort of thought that, you know, I always think it's really interesting. Artists say um, that the viewer should decide what a painting means or that kind of thing. But I, I, I wonder, um, it just feels a difficult thing as that, that as an artist, you produce a piece of work and then you have to listen to other people's interpretations. How do you feel when their interpretations are completely different to the interpretation you would have given to a piece of work? I fully expect that. I am of the view, really, that the viewer is who finishes the work. The work when you create art, it's your art. When it's exposed to people and they recognize and it resonates to them, that's when it's art. It ceases to be your art, it's now art. And so they have full reign for its interpretation, for its understanding. For, they do with it whatever they wish because it's they who are making it. I'm just doing the magic that sets off the um, the perception of other people's minds. That's all I'm doing. So, so, so it I'm, doesn't it doesn't worry you uh, not no, being no, able no, to no. Commu commu communicate a particular message doesn't really worry you or. Well, I don't think that it doesn't communicate that message. Okay. I think that it communicates other messages as, as well. well. Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 
though, though the extent to which the message that I intend is in fact communicated is questionable, dubious, it fluctuates, sometimes I'm successful, sometimes I'm not, sometimes, sometimes it, it, they don't get it at all. <laughs> but none of it matters to me really, because I am so in tune with the making of it. When I'm done with it, I'm done with it. You know, a lot of them I put in the garbage. <laughs> That's very sad. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm only interested in making it, you know? Yeah. I was not only these artists who had exhibitions and made a lot of sales and then several collections. I wasn't lucky in that. I was lucky in the way that I could do whatever the hell I wanted. I could do whatever I wanted, not constrained by any expectations of me or any desires to please anybody. Or I, a line in one of these films that I made here, 40 Pieces of Political Art of ERB, says, to be celebrated. Your work has to show that you are sedated. And so then his wife took offense, took objection to that. So I had to remind her that Venezuelan himself censored us. Basil Thompson, one year, painted a homeless woman, a wonderful painting. The subject was not a wonderful one. Then it felt that it was an embarrassment to the authorities so he would not have allowed it into the national exhibition. If your work didn't show that you were sedated, you couldn't be celebrated. Mm. One verse is true, so you understand what's going on with all of these celebrated artists. Yeah. But um, some other things I want to tell you about, uh, I think I'll, I'll tell you about, I don't remember many things. So ask me another question. Well, so one of the other things I, I want well, to tell I wanted to tell you about this, uh, this Philip Moore film. Yes. You're in trouble with me about this Philip Moore film. You are in deep trouble with me about this film. I saw this film, surprisingly. What? I am in the Diana Street. Page? What? But the thing is, the thing is just day like it fell out of the deep blue sky. There is none of this glorious introductions that you write for all of the other cultural things and notes that you put on that page. There is not even an attribution as to who it is that made this film. You know how hard it is to make a film in 1995? Dennis Williams said to me in 1974, and I thought he was absolutely out of his mind. He took me one day, one year as I returned home for the August holiday. He somehow took me to see his newly installed 1763 monument. He put the damn thing up on a high, 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 high pedestal. That was never Philip Moore's intention. So my intention is to get it back down and drunk. Let coffee on the ground, let him walk among us so we can absorb his aspiration, his ideas. But anyhow, Philip Moore, said to me, you are going to make a film about this monument. I said, me? How? Oh, when? He said, never mind, it will happen. 18 years later, I did. <laughs> <laughs> and you go and put it on the guy on the stage stage and don't even say that it's me put it. You got some good lashes to get here, I tell you. Oh, no, no. <laughs> no, but it does, it does, it says your name. Where? In the credits? Who reads the credits? You read the credits to any film? Huh? Who were the sponsors of that film? Who were the sponsors of that film? Oh, dear. Okay. You don't know. Nobody reads the credits. You have to write your introduction. No, you know what it is? It, with, with the Guyana Speaks thing, we try and put something on every day. But because both of us are working, we don't have that much time. <laughs> so sometimes I just pop it in there and I hope I hope people will watch it and then get engaged and kind of tease out their own conversation yeah, from it. Get, get more licks but, uh, but yeah, okay. I, I accept, I accept. <laughs> I spoke in a meeting, cultural officer of the CARICOM secretariat. You know what she said? She has the audacity to see. When we are ready to make our plans for Cali Festival, we don't know who are the artists to speak to. When you are ready to make economic plans, you don't know who the economists are. The whole thing smacks of the general disrespect and disregard that our society has for the artist. You don't have an appreciation of what the, who the artist is and what he does. She, he or she does. The CARICOM cultural officer doesn't know who the artists are, whom she should consult with in the making of plans for cultural matters. I mean, that says it all. <laughs> no, completely. But so um, one of the one of the things I was really interested in was the things of like your kind of intellectual genealogy. Like, what are the things? 
uh, who are the kind of artists that, that kind of really inspire you or that you might have been influenced by or? Um... I don't know about it, because as I tell you, I went to school in Canada. Um, so all of my education was completely, they didn't even know who was a Caribbean artist. Mm. They, they are not the foggiest idea that the Caribbean even produced that. It was all Kandinsky and Frank and Tyler and Miro and that is that is what my schooling is. Mm. I had to unschool myself when I returned to the Caribbean. People like Philip Moore and George Simon were hugely exciting to me. Mm. Philip Moore has an atavistic intention of, of, of African uh, um, cultural um, realities. Mm. George Simon is unearthing a local aesthetic bringing forth new uh, forms, new expressions that have no bearing on Europe and what Europe determines uh, aesthetically. So I am allowed to, not that my work reflects that, my, my, my appreciation, my interest lies more in Philip Moore and George Simon than it does in the School of Paris works of Stanley Griffith. My interest is more in the the works of Omo Brachet, who understands that a hurricane don't roar in a pandemic of then Derek Walker, who is this whispered tones of, of, of Eurocentricity. Mm. Uh, George Lamin, who recognizes our worth, is a hugely interesting to me. In the castle of my skin is the very first book that launches him uh, on the international scene. He recognizes us as being worthy as against V.S. Yes, Knight Paul, whose view is nothing was ever made in the Caribbean. Mm. So it is. That's, that's interesting. So how, what's, what was your relationship like with your father then? Because if he, if he had a kind of, maybe a class, affected by ideas of class and status, and you're, you don't, you aren't, I mean, you know, how, how did that affect your relationship with your fa father or did it? Um, we had a very complex relationship. Uh, he was a man who recognized his responsibility was to nurture his children. And so when I came of age to make a decision, he supported it, even though he may not have thought, like for instance, my decision to go to art school. He cautioned me that, you know, this is a, I don't know how you are going to manage your life. You, you see what goes on in this society with artists? Nobody is really an artist. People are, teachers and broadcasters, Mark, what are you going to do with art? You could, you could, why don't you do accountancy? <laughs> I got a distinction in mathematics. <laughs> you I, I like that you have a distinction in mathematics, but no money. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's a feat. <laughs> well, mathematics have to do with money. Well, at least you count it. <laughs> <laughs> like I went into counting money. I worked in the bank. I went into keeping other people's money. I had the keys to the vault. <laughs> That's the closest I got to money. <laughs> what, were we, what were we talking about? Well, about we were talking that. about the influences or, or people that you'd admired, yeah, like George Simon, Philip Moore, yeah, you know. George Simon and his brother, um, yeah. Oswald, Oswald yeah. Hussein. They bring the most they bring the most miraculous thing. They're completely different. They're coming out of a completely different aesthetic. Yeah. yeah. So that sort of stuff and shit. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I, I realized actually we we we'd moved on from that to talk about your relationship with your father and him saying yeah, right, that's right, how right. we that's where we got to, yeah. yeah. So I'm telling you, um yeah. though he had his view of the world, he was prepared to put himself solidly behind his children. He was a man who um, didn't have a formal education. He was self And uh, he made sure that all of his children had a tertiary education. That inspiration flowed on. All of his children's children have tertiary education. Their children are coming on stream now. Several of them are in university. He has nine grandchildren and four children. Their training spans the full range of possibilities. We have from a genetic engineer, the studio artist. So his, though he may not have been of a mindset that, uh, that, that I followed, he had basic approaches to family that were solid. Mm. 
he supported us all with whatever it is he wanted to do, even if it were the things that he did not think were the things we should do. Huh? So it, my interest in art did not conflict with him. My wish to study art, he supported that fully, fully. So, um, but in terms of his, his, his attitude to, to society, his, his ranking, his, 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 his ideas about hierarchy in society, I didn't share any of those ideas. And so those things put us in conflict, but we managed those conflicts uh, well. It never became a problem. So he okay, um, we've run 30 minutes of this. So I think we'll stop there because it's, what time is it now? Coming up to four. Um, so let me just stop sharing the screen for the time being. Um, just reading some of the questions on here. Anyway, you see what I mean when I, I, I say that um, Errol gave me a good telling off <laughs> part of the way through. Um, Errol, you know, thank you so much. That was, that was uh, a really interesting uh, interview and I hope everybody will go on to watch the remainder of it. Um, I loved um, Errol's, uh, you know, to be celebrated, your work got to be sedated. <laughs> was really good and I liked his thing about keep your scholarship going to shovel snow now <laughs> Just, <laughs> there were so many funny bits I was halfway through that I was trying to ask um Rod what what would like um Errol's call name be or something like that in Guyana because he's you, Errol you're so animated and you're so uh, energized you know it's really I actually really enjoyed watching that again that was actually um fantastic but so does anybody have any questions they would like to um, ask Errol directly? Um, I'm just trying to see if there's anything in the chat. I, I know Rod has said that he'll make sure that everybody gets to see the, um, the Philip Moore documentary. I think it's actually on Guy yeah, to Speak. Just put, <clears throat> somebody just put the, uh, yeah. um, Somebody's already, yeah, I think it's um, Beryl? Verily um, has put the um, link into uh, the Guyana Speaks page. Um, chat. Sorry, chat into the chat section. Um, but I can't see any particular questions. So I don't know if, if, if um, Corinne is saying, who's going to make, ah, who's going to make a documentary about Errol? <laughs> That's the big question. I don't know, Corinne, uh, maybe, Maybe you, can you make a documentary? That'd be so fantastic. I think, um, Errol, if you, I'm gonna unmute you, or can you unmute yourself? Cause I just wanted to ask you, um, you know, where do you sell your art? If people are interested in purchasing your work, where would they go to purchase your work? I don't think I've ever sold a picture. Come on, you must have <laughs> sold that picture. <laughs> In fact, I, 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 had, I had a look online I'm to like, see if I could yeah, buy some of your work. Wife to make me. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't have like um, your own website where you advertise your work or anything? Um, uh, I'm on the Fine Arts of America website. I'm on uh, um, uh, Stachy. Yeah. I'm also on Les Isles. But I'm mostly on my own Facebook page. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did actually go on to the actually, website. Made, made, let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. I've actually made several short features on myself. Of late, I probably did the work that I've been doing. So I, for instance, made a short three-minute um, video. You should post them to your Facebook, uh, to the Guyana Speaks Facebook page. The Therapeutic Art of Earl Ross Booster. I posted another one. The Political art of Earl Ross Booster, another one, the, um, the geometric aesthetic of Earl Ross Booster. Um, and then I made a series of short one minute video art uh, features. Just one minute, silent, just pictures. Um, so there are a few, um, there are a few uh, video, um, videos out there that feature me, that I made myself. Nobody's doing, I don't expect anybody to do it, so I do it myself. <laughs> <laughs> this girl already claimed she's not a filmmaker. <laughs> she begged off right to me. I'm not a filmmaker, don't ask me. <laughs> so I don't expect anybody to do it. I did it myself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, so I look for them on my Facebook page. Or go to my Facebook page because this Juanita will post them on her page, but she won't tell you all it is me. 
I, I, I will, I will. I, I, as part of the bargain, after being told off, I was like, I'm never going to be told off again by Errol. Yes, <laughs> I, I'm going to post loads of the links <laughs> onto the Guy to Speaks Facebook page. So, um, but I'd also just say, if people are interested in buying your work, go to Thank the Fine so Arts of much. America um, webpage and also to start to next week. <laughs> I'm expecting to be going to the bank. You all here? Please. <laughs> He needs to count Mama some money. <laughs> you're right to me. I'll tell you the details. 16 by 20, full color. Let's get it going. <laughs> All of you ladies who are so enthused that at last there is a lady VP, as if it makes a difference. You know, no different. You know, you know that. You know that that happened. Black faces in high places that makes no difference. We're going to find out if this woman going to make a difference now. We're going to find out if this woman going to make a difference now. There's always hope. Okay. There's always hope. She's, she's a strong mm -hmm. character. So, uh, that is why I painted it. Yeah, yeah. That's why I painted it. I'm hoping, hoping and hoping and hoping. Set me free. Come on, come on, come on. <laughs> so, Rule okay. equality. Um, don't walk and don't look back. <laughs> Hey, um, Errol, what you was the book I'm reading did, right did you have a, a, a call name? This is the book I'm reading right now. Cast. No, I wanted to know if you had a call name in, in Guyana. Yeah. Call me by my name. <laughs> no, 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 you know, like a name like, I don't know. Um, they call me by my name. I don't know what something. I'm calling it. <laughs> you don't have a call name? Maybe crazy. But that's already taken by the Trinidadian, by the Trinidadian Colombian, so I guess I have to let that go. <laughs> okay. Anyway, listen. So um, it's four o'clock. So this is when we officially um, normally would close uh, to our um, guy to speak today. I must remind everybody about the last Sunday. I think it's the twenty eighth of February is when we have our next guy to speaks event. Um, and we will be having Stacy Dos Santos Rahman, who's from Visit Guyana. So she's going to be speaking. We've also got um, Egbert Carter, um, who uh, I think most many of you will know Egbert. He's done a lot of work on Guyanese um, architecture, and he's a sort of well-known Georgetown historian. Um, and we will also. <laughs> be having uh, a poet, a spoken word poet, um, Khadija, I think, I think Khadija surname is Donna, maybe I'm probably pronouncing it incorrectly, but um, all the details will be put up on the Guyana Speaks page as usual, and, um, and also on Twitter, and anybody who's already on our Guyana Speaks database will be um, noted. April is saying, uh, asking if she missed Marissa speaking. Uh, yes, sorry, April. Um, but we are going to play, uh, to play us out will be, um, I'll put on Marissa's um, I Love Guyana tune. So you're all welcome to, um, well, actually, let's listen to the tune first and then unmute yourself. You can all uh, uh, wind up and thing while I'm um, playing it. Well, hold on a minute. Let me share the screen again. And we will play now. I have to get back on to this. Here we go. Um. Diana, oh, Diana.
Something like Hot Karen. I just can we all unmute ourselves and just thank all the presenters today, all the speakers. And just thank you. 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 Yeah, I was asking where they would get all this information. If you go onto the Guyana Speaks Facebook page, I'll be posting everything on there. So you will get the recording with Errol, you'll get the, as, as long as Marissa's okay with it, you'll get the song as well, and the recording of today. So, yeah. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Hi, Greer. Uh, bye. Hi, Grant. Hi, Grant. I want to say a brilliant mind. Thank you so brilliant much. Brilliant mind. Thank you. A lot of people think I'm crazy. <laughs> I, love, I love the bus stop. Errol, the bus stop. Yeah, fantastic. Was, was that film uh -huh. from your bicycle bus? I want to put Stacey Abrams on the next bus stop, but I'm afraid to get locked oh up. Oh, <laughs> oh, no, she's gone. Errol, where are you going to have a bicycle bus? Errol, what? have you got about the call, Arvin? Are you related? Sorry.